This video is brought to you by MUBI, a curated online cinema streaming exceptional films from around the globe. Get your first month for free at MUBI.com slash Royal Ocean. Listen. You smell something? So, since the very beginning, this is what the theatrical experiences always look like at arguably its purest. An individual sitting down in a dark theater watching a bright screen, and that's it. And yet, throughout the entirety of film history, there have always been those who tried adding on to that experience in various ways. The most notable example being... But despite 3D being the most famous example of a theatrical gimmick, it's definitely not the only one, and nor is it the most bizarre, laughable, or just gloriously hammy. For that, enter smell vision It was the 1939 New York World's Fair, and the eyes of the public were on the world of tomorrow. Somewhere in between exhibits on cosmic rays and the unveiling of Electro, the smoking robot, was this man, Hans Laub, who had arrived at the fair to present the newest cinematic technological marvel that theoretically produced distinct smells as quickly and as easily as the soundtrack of a film produced sound. Centivision. Now, of course, to any contemporary audience looking back, such an idea seems entirely unnecessary, distracting, and just plain goofy. But remember, this was 1939. Not only had cinema practically just been born, but it had barely been a few years since sound itself was introduced. Good, 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 Goodbye. And it certainly wasn't devoid of naysayers decrying it as just some sort of gimmick. It's just a toy. It's a scream. It's vulgar. RF, do you think they'll ever really use it? I doubt it. The Warner Brothers are making a whole talking picture with this gadget. The jazz singer. They'll lose their shirts. What do you think of it, Dexter? It'll never amount to a thing. So, smell, why not? If you could add sound to films, then why not smell? Why couldn't it be just as valid an element to add into the movie business? That, at least, was Laub's line of thought. But exhibitors didn't bite. Or rather, they wouldn't until two decades had passed. Michael Todd Jr., son of the famed producer and Todd A.O. founder, had met Laub at the World's Fair and remembered him when he was looking for methods of enhancing the experience accompanying his films. The two signed a deal, acquired a patent, and gave the process a bright and shiny new name. smell vision And this was how the darn thing worked. Laub's system centered around what he called a smell brain, inside of which were a series of perfume containers arranged in the order they'd be released. As film advanced through the projector, the smell brain would be cued, releasing scents which were then blown by a fan through pipes to individual vents underneath audience members' seats. All of which may in fact sound incredibly overcomplicated, especially in light of a very simple little design that came only a few years later that we all know far better. The scratch and sniff card. <laughs> So recently, I got some friends together to show them the best, one of the best, just the best film experience that involves scratch and sniff cards. John Waters' camp classic, Polyester. Please leave us alone. My family hasn't done anything to you. I'm a big Christian woman. Which, if you haven't seen it, takes a bit of a prankish spin on the whole concept. Odorama will enable you, the viewer, to actually smell right from your movie seat some of life's most fragrant odors. When a number appears on the screen, that is your signal to scratch and to sniff the same number on your odorama card. Hmm. Yeah? Hmm? Look, use anything you want. Does it actually smell? Does it? Wow! Use your it's really hmm? Number one. So cool. A spin that I maybe kind of definitely left out when telling everyone what we were watching. Make no mistake though, smell vision was no odorama. It wasn't meant as any kind of prank, but in fact something to be taken entirely seriously. That said, Hans Laub and Mike Todd Jr. were well aware of the aesthetic limitations that the system presented. Just because smell vision could theoretically be added to any film didn't mean that it should. I mean, I don't think anyone's ever watched the climax of Casablanca and thought, you know what this is missing? 
lavender. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. But what about us? We'll always have Paris. For Smellivision to prove successful, a film would have to be developed in tandem with the system. Enter 1960's Scent of Mystery. Directed by famed cinematographer Jack Cardiff and starring Denholm Elliott, Peter Lorre, and Elizabeth Taylor. One of the very first films specifically written and shot to be seen, heard, and smelled. The story, a sort of discount Ian Fleming mystery charade, follows Elliot's mystery novelist as he attempts to foil a plot to murder an American heiress who just so happens to be wearing some particularly enticing perfume. Scent of mystery, magnifico. Irresistible, see. A lot of the integrated odors the film features are somewhat obvious. A peach, grass, gasoline, and some of them come across pretty forced and unnatural, especially when watching the film without the original smells being piped in. What are you drinking? You must keep your heads. Special coffee, very strong. However, the film does feature one notable use of the system. The story's primary villain, seen almost entirely throughout in only shadows and silhouettes, is revealed at multiple points by the recurring smell of pipe tobacco. Si, senor. Expectations for the film were high, with many excited at the prospects Smellivision could offer. Remember, it was the late 1950s. Television had arrived and the theatrical market was changing, with producers and exhibitors jumping at anything new, exciting, and enticing, and that may just make them a quick buck, no matter how gimmicky or over the top it may seem. Walk down any street of theaters in any major city in the late 50s or early 60s and it wouldn't be all out of place to see a bright, bold ad for the hypnotic eye presented in Hypno Magic, in which the lead character looked straight at the audience at the end of the film and proceeded to hypnotize every last person in the theater. And now, if you dare, look into the hypnotic eye. Look into the eye. If you saw The Lost Missile in 1958, you got a shock tag to monitor your vitals during the film with the promise that anyone shocked into a comatose state by the film would get a free ride home in a limousine. There were prop giveaways. Men were given Dracula fangs and women zombie eyes when seeing the double bill Dracula Prince of Darkness and the Plague of the Zombies. And before you could see Francis Ford Coppola's debut feature, Dementia 13, you had to pass a 13 question test that included such questions as did you ever do anything seriously wrong for which you felt little or no guilt? And have you ever been hospitalized in a locked mental ward, sanitarium, rest home, or other facility for treatment of mental illness? Fail any of the questions and you were not allowed in. Hey, I got something I want to show you. Yes? It's long. Ooh. And it's sleek. Ooh. And it's powerful. Ooh, what is it, Todd? It's my new vet. Oh. This ridiculous world of gimmicks was the world John Waters was paying the sincerest of homages to with his prank in polyester. But more than anyone else, it was an homage to this man, William Castle, king if there ever was one of the film gimmick. To give you a picture of who William Castle was, let me point you to 1939, when he was directing a play of his own. Tickets could hardly be handed out for free they were selling so horribly, the show practically dead on arrival. However, just before the show opened, the play's German-born lead actress received an invitation to perform in Munich, straight from the Third Reich itself. The actress refused, but to William Castle, this was an opportunity. One morning it was discovered that the theater had been vandalized, with swastikas painted along every wall. Newspapermen got a hold of the story. This wasn't just any ordinary play anymore. No, this was a play starring the girl who said no to Hitler. And the result? Castle's play proceeded to sell out. An instant success. And the individual who vandalized the theater? Well, I think you already know who it was. Strike up the montage music, please, and thank you. After directing a cavalcade of B pictures for Columbia, Castle set out on the independent route, and to help sell his first self-financed horror film, Macabre, he not only hired girls to stand in as fake nurses outside theater doors just in case anyone needed medical attention, 
but had the genius idea of passing out to every member of the audience a certificate for a thousand dollar life insurance policy in case they should just so happen to die of fright from the film. <laughs> Macabre was a hit, and Castle was only just getting started. House on Hunted Hill was filmed in Emerjo. 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 It's a new process, and what actually happens, Ralph, is the ghosts and the skeletons leave the screen and all the objects leave the screen and wander throughout the audience, go up to the balcony, roam around, meet the public, and go back into the screen. <laughs> of course, what he really meant was that a skeleton with glowing red eyes was attached to wires above the theater in order to swoop in and float above audience members' heads to parallel the action on the screen. The Tingler was filmed in Percepto, in which Castle had the bright idea to attach small vibrating motors to the undersides of a few select theater seats, set to buzz during the film's climactic moments as Vincent Price exclaims to the audience, The Tingler is in the theater. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not panic, but scream! Scream for your lives! The Tingler is loose in this theater, and if you don't scream, it may kill you! Scream! Scream! 13 Ghosts was shot in Illusiono, and I'll let Castle explain this one. When you see 13 Ghosts, you'll be given a supernatural viewer like this, which will enable you to penetrate for the first time into the spirit world. Those brave enough could watch the movie and see the ghosts by looking through the viewer's red cellophane side. Those cowards too scared were to look through the opposite side's blue cellophane, where theoretically, the ghosts of the film would be hidden. Castle was a huckster if there ever was one, blurring the line where cinema ended and reality began. He was like Diet Hitchcock, or Roger Corman's slightly more sophisticated cousin. And with every success, he upped the ante going plain bonkers. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not reveal the ending of Homicidal to your friends, because if you do, they will kill you. And if they don't, I will. With Mr. Sardonicus, Castle introduced the punishment poll. If you want to show him no mercy and punish him as he deserves, then hold up your punishment pole ballot with the thumb pointing down, like this. If, on the other hand, uh, you're one of those I wouldn't hurt a fly kind of people, one of those sweet, nice, kind souls uh, who would let Mr. Sardonicus go free, you should hold your ballot with the thumb pointing up, like this. Supposedly, no audience ever voted for life over death. No mercy. So be it. You have given the verdict. You have made the decision, and the majority of you have sentenced Mr. Sardonicus to further punishment. Uh, this time, uh, we have even a stranger tale to unfold. Ooh. Ah, blood. 1961's Homicidal featured a fright break timer over the terrifying climax. You hear that sound? It's the sound of a heartbeat. A frightened, terrified heart. This heart is going to beat for another 25 seconds. To allow anyone to leave this theater who is too frightened to see the end of the picture. Those who didn't have the stomach were instructed to walk out to Coward's Corner, where they could get a full refund on their ticket, plus a blood pressure test from a nurse if they so wished, all the while a recording blasting, watch the chicken, watch him shiver in Coward's Corner. <laughs> I'm right here, Miriam. But the thing about gimmicks is that they're short-lived, if they ever even get off the ground. Scent of Mystery, the first film to feature Smell-O-Vision, opened in three theaters in February of 1960, and was a complete and total disaster. Hans Laub's system basically broke down, smells were released with an odd distracting hissing behind them, Odors were released at the wrong moments, and the smells were often too faint for different sections of the theaters. And despite the system's glitches being fixed after those initial screenings, the damage had been done, and the word of mouth was absolutely scathing. With one patron notably bemusing that he couldn't actually understand the film because he had a cold. Smell-O-Vision was dead on arrival. 
Even William Castle, by the later 1960s, began to put the bricks in the gloriously hammy gimmicks he'd become so well known for. But that's of course not to suggest that film gimmicks are a thing of the past. After all, you can still head down to your local multiplex for a screening with these suckers. But beyond that, look at things like Cinemark's D-Box Shaking Chairs. Or Paramount's campaign with Paranormal Activity, inviting audience members to demand local screenings. What are they, if not gimmicks? And so knowing that, what'll be next? This video is brought to you by Mubi. So one of the weird issues I think we've all faced with streaming services is just how overloaded they can be. Not only are great films lost in the mix, but there are so many different possible choices that I actually think I end up spending more time browsing through films and adding things to watch lists than I do actually watching anything. Mubi, however, takes a different approach. They feature only 30 films at a time, with one added and taken away every day. And I think that's such a fascinating strategy. Instead of just anything and everything being dumped on the service, every single film comes lovingly hand-picked and curated, so you know it's something worthy of checking out. And right now, you can try it out for free for 30 days by going to mubi.com slash royalocean. Lame.